It is just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Sean Field. He's a CEO and founding father of Patrick Consulting Group, Inc., and is also the senior dental consultant and main speaker uh, for their dental performance coaching firm. Sean always makes sure that every client knows who he is and that he can always be called upon to ensure absolute client satisfaction. He comes from a background of dental practice management, treatment coordination, and dental sales. He has helped numerous dental practices achieve record-breaking success. Sean has experience assisting in the growth of practices in the range of one owner private offices to multi-doctor DSO practices, and has had success in scaling dental organizations, even in downward economies uh, like the 2008 crash. Sean has helped to open the doors of communication and the practices he has worked with to ensure accountability, consistency, and growth. Sean is an expert in the sales process when it comes to case presentation in a dental setting. He has sold millions of dollars in treatment and is well-versed in increasing the case acceptance rate of a dental office. Sean's niche is reinforcing the need of treatment, getting the patient to take full responsibility in their dental care, and get them to agree to pay upfront in full for their comprehensive case. Sean has a wide understanding when it comes to body language during the sales process and is able to teach dental teams on what to look for during case presentation in order to give the treatment coordinator an insight into what the patient is thinking during case presentation and whether they are moving closer to or further away from accepting treatment. In addition, Sean helps train dental teams in what language is most effective when selling in a dental practice in order to help build rapport and trust with their patients. As a dental consulting firm, Patrick Consulting Group um, are dental consultants, coaches specializing in treatment coordination. Um, you know, Sean, one thing that always bothers me, let, let me uh, try to find this uh, um, real quick. Um, Ba sure. ba basically, it's um, when, when you look at cars. I mean, I mean, this is a fact that I just can't get out of my mind. Um, the average new car price in America is thirty three thousand five hundred sixty dollars, according to Kelly Blue Book and USA Today. On average, an American will buy thirteen new cars by age seventy six. Source: Anthony Pratt, poll director of forecasting. So here we live in a country where the average American. 13 times is going to buy a new car for 33000 yet 95% of dentists will practice from 25 to 65, never sell one complete comprehensive case for 33560 it, it, and, right. when, and when you talk sales, they say, oh, I didn't go to college eight years to be a salesman. And I mean, it's right. just, I mean, it, you're, you're an alien. Why are you in dentistry? You should be working and selling planes and trains and automobiles. Why sure. did you pick? I mean, it'd be, it'd be like, I mean, it's crazy. But why do dentists hate sales when they're selling what they're most passionate about? I mean, it's optimum oral health, full mouth restoration and they always blame everything on the insurance company like on these 13 new cars an american will buy how many of those cars will be paid for by their dental insurance plan none right right none right and, and they've right. got a dentist has 99 excuses of why he can't sell dentistry and none of them are is that it's his fault it's certainly not his fault it's it's the economy. It's Obama. It, it, it's it's the the stock market. It's everything, but you can't sell dentistry. And when you can't sell dentistry, your patients don't get their disease fixed. So so you can't do anything. That's the thing. I mean, you can't do like so. We we say like we call it the S word in dentistry. And a lot of times when we're, we're doing presentations, we say. You know, it, it, is sales a bad word or a good word in your practice? A lot of times, refreshingly, a lot of people raise their hand and say it's a good word. But the, the, the problem is a lot of times they bring their own psychology into it of, oh, the patient's going to say no or kind of like pre-assume the objections that the patient might have. So they kind of start to talk themselves out of it. Like, oh, well, we'll just start here. Or we'll start even quadrant dentistry, or we'll start with just this one tooth or what is it? The the trick really is that you just gotta get the patient to want to need, want, basically get them to want the need of treatment. So um, I'm kind of going like full blown into it. I apologize, but no. you know, we have a thing called the, 
the five steps of treatment coordination and the first, very first step is know that you're going to close the case. So kind of like you're asking like, well, why can't these guys sell the dentistry? A lot of times they just aren't comfortable talking about the money. And you know what? That's totally okay. That's why a lot of times they need somebody in the office that's totally okay talking about the money because I hate the blood and guts. I'd pass out if I, I don't, one time I was watching uh, an extraction being done. I think it was a full mouth extraction. I almost passed out. I can't take that. But I'm not like a uh, a bad person just because I don't like that end of it. 50% of it is clinical. 50% of it is the financials. So really, it's not – first of all, the dentist shouldn't be doing anything but what we call a clinical close, meaning just getting them to understand – reinforcing the need of treatment and what we call fear of loss. What will happen or the why behind treatment if they don't do this? So this filling is going to turn into, you know, a crown or a buildup. This crown or buildup is going to turn into an RCT core crown buildup. If you don't do that, you're going to lose the tooth. If you lose the tooth, you're going to have spacing and so forth and so on. So really what you need is somebody in there that understands how to explain things to the patients in a very general terms that they'll understand, but at the same time, making it financially affordable for the patient as well as mentally affordable. So it's five steps. Number one, assume you yeah. will present, sell, and close the case. Correct. Yeah. So number one, know that you're going to close the case because a lot of what happens. So we talk about a lot of um, kind of the psychology. We did a, uh, a CE course for Dental Town as well. Um, and it was basically about the psychology behind why the patients say yes or no to diagnose treatment. So there's five steps. One, know that you're going to close the case because a lot of, um, I don't mean to get like too weird about it, but the humans in general will pick up off of the energy or the vibe that you're pushing out to them. So if you go into that case presentation, especially when you're talking about financials, if you go in there going, oh man, they're never going to buy it. They're never going to buy it. They're never going to buy it. And you go in there and you say, oh, this is $5,000, Howard, how would you like to pay for it? It's a much different discussion than you knowing in your head, even like, uh, you know, it's a thing called envisioning, like sitting down where you're putting that treatment plan together, even closing your eyes and saying, and just kind of even just being picturing that, that patient saying yes to you and realizing that you're confident going into it. So one, no, you're going to close the case. Two, you got to make friends with the patient. And it may sound like an old kind of sales philosophy, but if the patient, especially when you're talking about money, if there's not a rapport built and the treatment coordinator or whoever's presenting the financials in the practice has to be able to be able to build that rapport very quickly with the patient. So when they do start talking about money, they're a lot more comfortable about that. And again, this whole step is kind of building up to the financial close. Uh, but that's step two is knowing, you know, one, knowing you're going to close the case two, making friends with the patient three, breaking it down into explaining the treatment basically into terms that the patient will understand will in capital letters underline three different times. So a lot of times the doctors will, if I said to you what a mesioclusal distal lingual is, it's, it's going to register right away. But if I say that to a patient that has no idea what dentistry is or what those what that dental lingo is, then they're going to basically – the problem is that they're never going to question the doctor because he – even if he's the most friendly guy in the whole world, he's going to poke him with uh, sharp needles. He's going to have drills. I mean – there's a big population of the dentists that doesn't, uh, I'm sorry, of the, um, of people that just don't go to the dentist in general simply because of fear. So if you start saying a mesioclusal distolingual just to explain a carry or what even was a carry, if you explain it, basically, if your seven year old grandson, niece, nephew, brother, sister, whatever the case might be, if they don't understand what it is that you're saying, they're never going to be able to understand or comprehend the price. So you've got to be able to, for example, instead of a mesioclusal distolingual, you've got to be able to say, well, Howard, this is basically like rust to a car. Now, again, you don't want to get so, you don't want to talk down to them, but you want to say, that you, you want to use a lot of analogies that explain exactly what's going on with that tooth. So this decay in the tooth is similar to the rust on a car. And, and you could do really the trick in, in dentist or in any kind of sales is putting the ball back in the patient's court and letting them decide so you're not shoving it at them. But if you're, if you're saying, okay, well, this is like rust to a car. If we don't do anything about it, then there's a really good chance it's going to continue to eat away at the tooth. A lot of times, if you can say what's happening to the tooth, 
but relate it back to money as the financial coordinator. Look, it's going to actually cost you a lot more money, Howard, if you don't take care of this now compared to we could do these six fillings for you right now and it'll be the cost of one crown. You could do totally whatever it is that you want to do. But if the patient doesn't understand the the basically what's going on with the treatment or what the treatment is, they're never going to comprehend the price. Four. So, is so what to, was three then? So how do you, is is to explain the treatment in general terms that the patient will understand. But is that, the, if, but that is that the dentist doing that? Is that the dentist doing the clinical close? Number one was no, you will close the case. Number two, yes. build rapport with patient. Is number Correct. three the dentist doing the clinical close? So it's a team effort. It's not just either the dentist or not the financial coordinator. It really starts from the very beginning of what is your, so we have another thing called the dental communication model. So it's basically the steps that the patient goes through either new or returning. A lot of times it focuses on the new. So it even focuses on your your, your Google My Business page, What? how many reviews you guys have, uh, were they referred by a friend or family, all the way down to the part where you get to actually have the patient in there. And the, pa- the doctor's doing what we call a clinical close. So they're not talking about any financials. It's just reinforcing the why behind treatment, what's going to happen if they don't do that, and what we call fear of loss. Fear of lossing them, not in a negative way, but just showing them, hey, you know, this is going to happen if you don't do this. And again, Howard, you could do whatever it is that you want to do. We're going to be here for you for whatever you guys choose. But the to answer your question, it's the clinical close and the financial close. In my opinion, the doctor should be the one talking about treatment, but I think it's totally okay for the financial coordinator to go in there, recap everything that's on there, not talking about price, but recapping everything that's on the treatment plan in a clinical manner as well, and then relating it into what's going to happen. So it's both. It's both the doctor and the the financial coordinator, whoever's doing the financials for you. Okay, so one was no, you will close the case. Two's build rapport with patient. Three's clinical close. Four's financial close. Three is basically just understand, getting the patient to understand why they need the treatment. So explaining it into terms, the, the technical, the step, we call it the five steps to treatment coordination. The third step is explain it to patients, explain the treatment to patients in, um, in verbiage or vocabulary that they're, they, they will understand. And to go for, like forward with that, essentially, if you're if a small child seven or under doesn't understand what you're saying, somebody without a dental dental background isn't going to either. Number four would be break it down. And this is sometimes kind of like a lot of times where the hiccup with a lot of the doctors are is break it down into a monthly payment plan. And we can go into this further, but break it down into a month, break the comprehensive treatment down into a monthly payment plan that the patients can not only financially afford, but mentally afford as well. And then number five is stop talking. <laughs> go through those deeper. Oh my God. The stop talking. I mean, they, they, they don't, they don't know when you, sh- you should end on a bang. I mean, you should, whether you're giving a presentation, I, I see comedians bomb like this all the time. They're, you know, they got a 30 minute set and at 26 minutes, they get a, Biggest laugh in the world, but they got to come back and do three dud jokes and then end on right. a lull when a seasoned speaker, comedian, when you just really get the house rocking, that's just when you close. Ready or not, yeah. it's time. Yeah. And yeah. uh yeah, so that 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 is amazing. So so let's um so let's just go back. Uh, what would you say about the online course? You said you had a uh so So we did an online course uh, for Dental Town called Treatment Coordination 101, the psychology behind why the patients say yes or no to diagnose treatment. And it actually goes, and we can go as far into depth as you want uh, today with it as well, but it goes, it's probably a three, three and a half hour training um, that goes through the entire psychology. Who was the the, uh, speaker on that? Uh, That was myself. Okay, it was you. It might still, yeah, it might still be, uh, because I talked to Howard. Yeah. Um, and went through everything for Howard. It might still be in the pipeline right yeah, now. Yeah, I was going to say, because I, I did not see that. I'm sitting there saying, are you kidding me? I mean, I know we got a lot of courses. We got 400 courses. And by the way, I mean, a course on Dental Town is 36 bucks. Uh, but yeah. a dentist, they, they, they have to spend 3600 flying across the country, going to some big old weekend thing. Yeah. 
I mean, they're just, just you could be so much better stewards of your money. So let's start at the beginning. Do you want to start at the beginning? Sure. Um, let's yeah, yeah, know, no, know you will close the case. Um, how so, do you get a dentist in that mindset? So, well, again, it's not just the dentist. It's his entire, it's his, her, it's their entire team, the, the entire team. So again, for example, if you could have the best clinical clothes in the entire world, you could have the best financial clothes in the entire world. You could step, the doctor could then step out of the room. This is more in a, uh, another training we have. It's called dental, the dental communication model. But you could have, you could step out of the room, have everything done, deal, signed, good to go. The a, assistant comes in, she's ready to, he or she is ready to, to, to take the impressions for, I mean, fill in the blank of whatever the procedure it is. And the patient could look up to them and say, let's say it's a root canal core and crown or an extraction. The doctor did a great clinical close. So they understand why they don't want to pull this tooth because it's just going to cause more damage to the uh, autonomy of the mouth. The, the anatomy of, and then the, the, Everybody leaves the room and the patient says, okay, well, and the, and the, the financial coordinator really talked them out of the extraction, which would have been 235 bucks compared to the 2000 RTT core crown. And the, they could turn to the dental assistant and say, do I really need this? And the dental assistant could say, I don't know. And then it kills everything. So that's, I'm just explaining like, that's why the whole team needs to be on board. They need to understand the psychology of the buying process of what happens when a patient says yes or no to diagnose treatment. Or they could say, well, Howard, it's totally up to you. But what I suggest is that you do this RCT or this root canal, this core buildup in this crown, because it's going to save the natural tooth, your God-made tooth. And if you do pull it, yes, it'd be a lot cheaper right now, but we'd have to put some bone in there to preserve the site because it starts shrinking really bad on you. Really, the worst part, though, Howard, is that things start to space. So yeah, it might be more expensive today, but in the long run, you're saving a lot more money and you're doing a lot less damage. Now, again, Howard, you could do whatever you want. Do you want me to go get the financial coordinator? Do you want me to get the doctor? No, 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 no. No, it's a much different discussion between, well, I don't know, and that. So the first part to answer your question is it's a whole team environment thing, but you got to know that you're going to close the case and you've got to be prepared to be comfortable with the, fi the, the full financial plan. In addition to piggyback off of that, I'm going to be really blunt and I apologize about doing so, but sometimes, especially in a cosmetic arena, let's say it's 25,000, let's say it's 40,000 for an all on four or four mouth rehab. Sometimes the financial coordinator doesn't even have that money to be able to spend themselves on that. So if the financial coordinator can't hypothetically knock on wood, they don't have that money to be able to do that. They have to essentially be able to, truly believe in the value of what the doctor is doing in the life-changing environment, whether it's a one tooth or it's a full mouth or whatever the, case, whatever the case might be, fill in the blank. Really, the best thing to do is if they're, oh gosh, I don't know. I don't know. This sounds like really expensive. And the, the, the financial coordinator is saying this, talk to the before and afters of like, when I sold cosmetic, I sold a lot of lumineers when they first came in. They were like, life-changing people would come in with these tetracycline stainings just really not like smiling but covering their mouth and you would i had ladies at the front desk cry that we would give them the mirror and they would just like and we were are you okay and yes i'm just so happy one know that you're going to close the case before you even walk into the room if you don't you have absolutely I'm being blunt. I apologize. You have absolutely no business being in the room talking about financials. Stick to whatever it is that you're really good at. Well, I, I want to I want to say the same thing um, with um, co-diagnosing and treatment planning. It's the same exactly. thing. Um, exactly. There's so many dentists that tell their staff, you know, um, they can't diagnose or treatment plan or all this stuff like that. And then if the staff ask a dentist a question, I have seen this and witnessed this in my own eyes several times um, where they'll ask a, um, a question to Dennis and he'll say, well, you know, if you want to know that, you should go to dental school and then walk to his private right. office and get on, you know, uh, some internet site. And so then when he leaves the room, that patient looks up at her and says, really? So I have to redo that whole crown because it's got a little gap and the assistant just rolls her eyes dead, dead on arrival. 
And it's yeah. group psychology. Yeah. It's the hygienist, the assistant, the receptionist. And if they don't have 100%. trust and faith in the diagnosis and treatment plan from the dentist, if they don't have freedom and lack of fear to ask their leader any question, um, it will make the patient walk. I mean, the, you know, so it, it, it's just, uh, and then the dentist said to me, well, Howard, it's illegal for them to diagnose and treatment plants. Like, dude, I'm pretty sure there's not one hygienist in jail today for diagnosing and treatment planning. I mean, you know, I mean, take a risk, walk on the wild side. Don't you want this person to get all 12 of their cavities fixed? Yeah, 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 yeah. So I like the I like to talk over with the hygienist, the assistant. I like to get everybody involved because then it's all believable. The patients trust it, and then when you leave, you're all on the same page. So they, they don't even get they don't even get the first fact that it's the entire team from answering the phone. This is the hygienist. And, and one last fact, I don't want to interrupt you. you I, this shows no, please you talking, but it's the same thing every consultant will tell you in a dental lecture. The you know the average lecture is a couple hundred people. The right side of the room, every row is a whole office. The dentist, the spouse, the high, the whole damn crew, and those guys are all do collecting. 1.2, 1.5. And then the other side of the room's all individual dentists and they're all making like 185 and they didn't bring their staff to save money. And it's like, really, you're saving money by not presenting and closing and financing any treatment plans? Really? How, how, you know, it's so number one, it's a team approach. And then, and then Agreed. you um, know you will close the case. So continue. <laughs> The other thing too is like because the co-diagnosing is 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 really important. And even if you don't want to diagnose, you can recognize or choose a different verbiage that you guys are okay with in there that it's not diagnosing. So this is what I recognize, or this is what you know. Even things like if you bring everybody into a role play of, you know, even the front desk a lot of times they may have no idea what the x-ray is or what the clinical looks like. If you're if you guys are recognizing as a team co-diagnosing, but changing the verbiage. If you're recognizing and having role plays, then even the person at the front desk could give them an idea of kind of, it's almost like volleyball. Like what you really want to do is you want to have a strong enough team that the team, including the hygienist can set the ball. So the doctor can come in and spike it. But the, you know, the dentist has to realize, especially if they're the owner, they're the coach of that team. And a lot of times they, and being very blunt, but a lot of times they have a very, well, this place wouldn't operate without myself. And this, I'm, it's, I'm here for this. And I'm, you know, it's all about me. It's, it's really, it's all about the patient because the number one person I always ask when I go into an office, who's the number one person in the practice? And they always say, oh, it's the dentist or, or it's, it's the office manager. It's the patient. Cause if we don't have, if we don't have the patient, we have no reason to even turn on a compressor in the morning. We have no reason to buy suction tips, et cetera. So Step two. Well, I, I can I can I add one thing to that? Please, please. Yeah. Um, I would take a note from the uh, slander and uh, oral definite um, defamation of character uh, lawyers, um, because you will see the greatest television host. They always wipe away all their legal lawsuit thing. If I said Sean Field um, is a uh, Irish drinking alcoholic. Well, then I have to prove that. And, and and those guys will say, well, you know, I mean, it's just my opinion, but I think Sean drinks too much. Well, you just said it's my opinion. You just said you don't know. So the hygienist can sit there and say, you know, I'm not the dentist, but to me, that looks like a cavity. Uh, I'm not the dentist, but I know I know Sean's going to say you're going to need a root canal and a crown. I mean, I've been working here 10, 20, 30 years. And so, so the whole legal diagnosis thing, number one, no one's in jail for it. No one's arrested for it. I mean, I'm, isn't there plenty of other things you could legally be worried about uh, than co-diagnosing and treatment planning with a patient, just telling them your opinion? So uh, just the dentist needs to lighten up and the staff just needs to uh, roll out um, um, slander, oral definition, uh, code words of just, in my opinion, you know, I mean, right, I'm the yeah, dental yeah. system, but in my opinion, I, I think I think Howard's going to say this, blah. So just yeah. get over yourselves and uh, move on to something. And it should be you went to dental school eight years so that you can teach someone to have less disease, misleading filled teeth. 
And, yeah. and if you can't get into selling that, but you love cars, then you know what? Get out of dentistry and go sell cars. You know, right, I, right. because as a dentist, I don't want other people on my team that don't like dentistry and don't think people should spend their first dollar on their health. I mean, yeah. do, you, do you want to have a heart attack and die while you have a Lamborghini in your garage? Or do you want to downgrade the Lamborghini to a Honda and go to a cardiovascular surgeon? So the only true wealth is health. And if you're a yeah. dentist and you don't believe that, you need to get your head examined. Okay, so so continue. So no, you will close the case sure. and then go, go on. And for, uh, to piggyback off that too, the other thing too, uh, the both on a business standpoint and on the patient standpoint is if you are not co-diagnosing or co-recognizing, you're actually wasting more time. So like, you know, the best of the best are going to actually go down the line and at, per minute, see where you guys are at as far as Basically, what I'm saying is that like how you're spending that time. So if the doctor is coming in and saying the same exact thing that the hygienist did rather than a co-diagnosis or rather than turning, hey, Shirley or hey, Steve, can you give me an idea of what you talked about with Sean here? It's 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 beneficial because you're actually saving time on the business time so you can do more production during the day. And at the same time, you're respecting the patient's time as well, because the most, like you said, the most valuable thing that we have as humans is time because it's finite. We're not going to be able to get that back. So both on the patient's end, I don't want to waste more time than I absolutely have to on yours. I want to make sure that you're a happy patient. That's why a lot of those doctors are trying to bring everything in house is so the doc so the patient doesn't have to go here, 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 here. They're respecting their time. And at the same time, think about your production. So if you're not co-diagnosing or you're not co-recognizing with them, then there's a really good chance that you're spending actually more time. And if you calculate that over a year's period of time, that's probably production. You're almost taking straight out of, out of your own pocket. So two, know that or make friends with the patient and, and big capital letters, it's usually immediately. So what happens is the worst case scenario is you could go in there and, and start saying, Howard, this crown's going to be $300. Uh, this bridge is going to be $1,500. This uh, scaling and root planing is going to be another $1,400. You've like already toned me out already. You've got to be able they, – they know that you've come there to talk about money as the financial coordinator – especially if they haven't seen you yet and you're kind of walking into the into the room for the first time. The other thing too is that if it could be done in a clinical setting, I know there's like differences of opinions on this in the consulting world, but if it, in my opinion, if it could be, if there's no break, so a lot of times the they do the clinical close, they pull the patient out of the room, they put them in some fancy uh, treatment coordination room or consult room. It really just takes everything. It almost puts more emphasis on the money rather than doing it in a clinical setting. So, for example, when I was doing treatment coordination, I always found something that I could relate myself to them so they knew that I was more like them. It's a human nature you know, thing. Anybody's going to do that. Even if I'm coming up to you at a party and I talk about – well, gosh, you know, like Howard, I love those rose colored glasses that you usually wear. How come you're not wearing those right now? There's the difference of, oh, well, he actually pays attention. He actually knows that I traditionally wear these or whatever the case might be. Usually I'm getting a little long winded. I apologize. Hmm. But I usually talked about Crocs. So when somebody would be wearing those Crocs, those really comfortable shoes, I kind of throw them off the financial train because they know, oh, this guy's coming to talk about money. He's just going to try and take all my money. He's going to take all my money. It's just a human nature thing when you start talking about money. So if they were wearing Crocs, I used to tell the story about, about my dad. And I'd say, you know, those, oh, I love the Crocs. I, the, those are the best shoes ever. And they'd like, oh yeah, I, I love them. And I'd say one, I saw them at a boat show and I couldn't help but buy them because the guy said, no, you got to try them on. They're incredibly comfortable. Cause I said, those things are so silly. And then the guy came around the the edge of the, the counter, put him down. He said, what size are you? I said, size 10. He put my feet in there. I was like, okay, I got to buy these things. I go home. I'm walking on clouds. I don't know. I don't, have you ever worn a pair of Crocs before? I don't even know what they are. It's, it's like, oh my God. It's There's like a boat plastic shoes. sandals. Yes, 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 yeah. yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yes. okay. So I brought them home and my dad said, those are the most ridiculous things I've ever seen in my entire life. Why would you wear those? And I said, no, 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 no. Dad, you don't understand. These things are incredibly comfortable. So he said, I would never, you wouldn't be able to catch me dead in those things. There's no way I would wear those. Okay, okay. 
So I come in a week later, I buy him a pair. I go back another week later and he's wearing them. And not only is he wearing them, but he's got the little Betty boops and the little stars. He's got the little moons in it. I know I'm kind of getting off point, but basically I tell that story every single time. And what it really does is it helps me very quickly build rapport with the patient. They know that I'm like them. And then at the same time, when I start to get down to that fourth step of break it into a, uh, you know, the, the comprehensive plan into a, into a monthly payment that they can not only financially afford, but mentally afford as well and stop talking, then I am friends with them rather than just a cold, hard, like they don't know me. I'm just a financial coordinator just going in there for the money. That was really long winded. I apologize. No, I, I think this is great. It's, it's every, you don't have to be a leader in dentistry to start talking about CAD cam, CBCT late. I mean, we're dentists, right? It's like, right. if you go meet a chef, he wants to hear about your new recipe or your grandmother's secret recipe. Uh, that That's not the issue. The The reason restaurants and dental offices lose money is because they love their 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 craft. They just don't understand their numbers. And, um, and this yeah. is something, I think the problem with what we're talking about here is the type of person that goes to eight years of college to become a surgeon is a scientist who mastered math and physics and chemistry and biology. And they want to do sit down and concentrate and do surgery. And they want to do all this stuff, but we're a social animal and social Mm -hmm. animals have to talk and communicate and they trade. And the, the, the mindset of a surgeon is not the mindset of a salesman and very few, very few dentists and physicians and lawyers uh, like or enjoy anything to do with business. So it's just, it's just a, a tough case. So you were on number three. Um, the croc story was about number three, build rapport with the patient immediately. That's number two. Yeah. Uh, make friends with the patient immediately. Okay. And do, you're building do, you, the and do you think um, humor, since you're about to do a oh, yeah. now, do you think humor is good or does that make light of you're a surgeon? You know, I, I think it really just kind of depends on if you, yeah, well, whatever. Like you said, the, the real trick is that you got to realize that you're dealing with another human being. You're dealing with emotions. People buy on emotions and then they justify with logic. So the problem, like you were saying earlier, is that dentists tend to be incredibly logical. So if you are if I'm an associate dentist and you want me to produce more and you want me to do implants, that's the time to be very uh, CAD cam uh, millimeters, you know, all the technical stuff. But when you start to talk to a human being, one, you have to have a relationship with them, even if it's done in five minutes or so, you know, the best salespeople in the world can have you basically hanging on to their next word of like, what is it? No, I want it. I want it. I need it. I need it. Of course I do. How do I afford this? How help, help me, help me rather than just kind of pushing it at them. So you, humor is a great thing. You know, if, if you can, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, if you're, if you're, if you're not a humorous person, I wouldn't try and make a joke unless it's a really good one. Like, like, for example, uh, do you know why, uh, Snoop Dogg carries a umbrella? No. Full drizzle. Of course. (laughs) I'm kind of getting off topic, but no, like if you, if you're not, if you're not a humorous person, no, I wouldn't push it. I would just really be yourself, but at the same time, be incredibly cognizant of how you're coming across to that person, and at the same time, what that person, how that person is coming across to you. In that training that we did for Dental Town, it talks a lot about the uh, the basically the buying process of what happens in a human's brain when you're selling to them. So, for example, even if for body language. If I'm real closed off and I'm sitting like this or I've got my legs crossed and I'm moving away from you, it's almost saying like, I'm just not interested in you whatsoever. But if I'm very open and I'm showing you my torso, I'm showing you my hands a lot, I'm leaning my head to the right, these are all things that are pre-done to basically, bluntly put, get you to like me as a human being in general. The, The greatest thing, a lot of times when I talk, people are like, well, you just, all you care about the money. All you care about is the money. It's not that. We have a saying at Patrick Atoli Group, whatever's good for the patient is good for the production, so why feel bad about the collection? Whatever's good for the patient is good for the production, why feel bad about the collection? All I have to do is know that my job is to go in there, build the rapport with you, and make you feel comfortable about spending that money with me. Because you're either going to go down the street and spend it with somebody else, 
or if I if the doctor hasn't done a good a well enough clinical close and I haven't done a good a, a well enough financial close, then what you're going to do is you're you're not going to understand the need of treatment and you're going to say okay, well um, the top left hand side's bothering me. Uh, let's start with that too. So again, it, it's like you said at the beginning, it's a whole team process. It's even at the beginning of how Sue answers your phones. If Sue's like, hello, how can I help you? It's a much different, I hate the, how can I help you smile today kind of thing. But if you're really, it's called the 80, 20 rule. If you're really listening to what the patient wants, uh, in anything, in any kind of sales environment, especially we're talking about financials in a treatment coordination setting, but the more you listen to the patient, the more you really care about what they want, the rest of the stuff will naturally come. So uh, there's a really good book, and a lot of people have probably already read it, but How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. And a lot of times what the, the biggest thing that stuck out to me in that book is that, and again, this can relate directly to, to financials in a treatment coordination setting, is that so many quote unquote salespeople walk around pounding their head against the, the, the ground going, why is this not working? Why is this not working? I'm putting in the hours, I'm going out, I'm meeting the people, but really they think me, 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 rather than, well, how can I help you? What's in the best interest for you? Let me listen to what's important to you. What is it that you know that you want? The more that I do that, the more likely you are to naturally choose me for the dentistry that you need done anyways. And if you don't get it done, it's just going to get worse and it's going to cost you more money. Howard, what do you want? Let me make it really easy for you to be able to do that. So number two is, you know, make friends with the patient because people don't buy from anybody they don't like, they buy from friends. So again, to recap, number one would be know that you're going to close the case because a lot of it's mental. And then right now is where we're at is make friends with the patient because people buy from friends rather than people they don't like. And then again, they buy with their emotions and then afterwards justify with their logic. This is awesome. Thank you. Um, and then um, I, I always tell them, I always tell everyone that the humans can rationalize anything. I mean, once they've made a bad decision, they can rationalize anything. You just see it all. Right. The, all they got to do is disconnect from reality and start telling you a story uh, that, that that they believe. And and but anyway, yeah. so so uh, know you will close the case. Build rapport with the patient immediately. Uh, people buy from friends. Um, so then, what's what's next? So next is uh, explain the treatment in terms that the patient will, capital letters, underline three times, bolded, italicized, that they will understand. Again, if – I'm trying to give it an example of like outside of dental, but if – if you say to somebody that has a cavity on their tooth that you have a mesial occlusal uh, distal cavity, that'll be $300. How would you like to pay for it? They'll look at you like a deer in headlights and they'll say, uh, I got to talk to my husband. I got to talk to my wife. I got to talk to my partner, uh, fill in the blank, because they have no idea what you're talking about. But if you explain it in terms that like remember in Philadelphia where uh, Denzel Washington kept saying to Tom Hanks, explain it to me like I'm a four-year-old. Explain it to me like I'm a four-year-old. That's basically the, the, the prince, principle of number three is explain the treatment to the patient in terms that they will understand. And you got to be really good. So you've got to be – and again, the whole team atmosphere. As a dentist, you've got to be willing to essentially – I don't want to, I'd say water it down, not dumb it down, but water it down and not in a condescending way. The problem is a lot of times dentists get out there, they get even more confusing. They get out their uh, pen and they start drawing on the tray table or they show a bunch of models and then they start getting really techy. So this is why you want to use this because this, this mesioclusal is lingual, this carrier, blah, 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 and then the patient just gets overwhelmed. But the problem is that the patient is never going, you're, Bluntly put, you're not at Best Buy. At Best Buy, if you're asking the Geek Squad, go ahead and ask any stupid question that you want. But you don't want to talk to somebody that's going to be poking you around with needles or drills or 
it's the fear of what will happen if you make them upset. Even if I, most of the dentists I've met are, are the nicest people in the entire world. They're gentle human beings. But like you said at the beginning, they're just explaining it and very tacky. They're, they're very similar to like architects. They want it. They have to be because you don't want some guy just zzz, and then slapping down a whole bunch of composite on you. You want really good dentistry. The problem is that unless there's a fail odor of the breath, pain, or the bite is off, they have no idea that you're using CAD CAM or the best composite material out there, or that you're using Shine or Benco or Patterson. They don't know, and it really doesn't matter to them. My favorite saying is that the best dentist in the entire world could fall flat on his face um, simply because he just doesn't know how to sell the treatment. But the, in the, if, uh, on the other end, the worst dentist in the entire world, if he can sell the treatment, he's always going to be able to produce more. That's why you want a marriage or a blend of both. You want the doctor performing the best work. You want the teams giving the best possible patient service. You want the the, to come in the middle and mix and have the patient be so happy that you save them from turning it into a crown or costing them more money or whatever it might have you. And then they go out and they're a walking billboard, especially for cosmetics. Look at, look at what, what Dr. Lee did for my teeth. It's, it's amazing. I'm living a better life. I married my dream woman. I blah, 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 blah. So you can't get there without being able to explain the treatment in terms that the patient will understand it, Explain it to me like I'm a four-year-old. That is amazing. That that show, Philadelphia, that was 1993. What an yeah. epic show. Um, yep. Yeah, it says, uh, yeah, that was his most common catchphrase. Um, yep. when, 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 they're, when they're going into dental geek land, um, whenever I'm talking to physicians, they, they never brag about their technology. They never talk about their hot new MRI. Or a dentist, I, uh, so many dentists believe that if I go to you and I don't have a CBCT and a laser and a caddy, if I don't have a, a half million dollars worth of uh, um, uh, quantum mechanics toys from Niels Bohr that you're not going to think I'm a good uh, dentist. Do, do you believe right. that? No, because the patient has no idea. They don't know what the, unless you're talking to one somebody that, if the guy that brings in the nope, everybody has this patient. He's an architect. He's a lawyer. A lot of times it's the architect. He brings in his yellow pad paper. He's got his pen. He's writing down everything you have to say. That guy, talk about CAD CAM till you're blue in the face. He's going to love it. Anybody else, you mom brings in her three kids, just fix them. I just need to make sure he's okay. I love little Johnny. I want to make sure he's healthy. He's safe. That's my job. If, is that that sad ma'am that you just mentioned, is that going to do that? They don't care. They have no idea. It comes down to give me the best amenities, give me the most comfortable chair, um, have the friendliest staff that's really there. For example, I worked for uh, a cosmetic, a big cosmetic doctor out here um, for a while. And he had this front desk. And her name was Maureen. Everybody called her Ree. And Ree's job was basically the front desk coordinator. But I'm being really blunt. I apologize. I keep saying that. But all people did was lean over and tell Ree, you won't believe what happened. Let me tell you the gossip. Let me tell you the gossip. Ree didn't really do much but gossip. And on paper, it sounded horrible. She was like the best, one of the best assets that the company actually had because people were coming in. That's what they care about. They care about the relationships. You want to build a team oriented environment where the patient feels like a VIP. They feel like your cousin. They feel like part of your family. It doesn't matter. Yes. When it comes down to it, like for example, loops, loops is awesome because it helps you do a much better job. The huge microscopes that an endo would use. Yes. It's really important, but they don't care about that. They care about get me out of pain, um, get me, I just got divorced. Give me the best possible smile you can get so I can go hit on some chicks or I can hit on some guys. Get me married. Um, my, my daughter's wedding is coming up. I can't have this white smile. They care about the result. They care about the experience that they've had. And then therefore that's what, what makes people go out. I mean, no matter what kind of marketing you do, it's still word of mouth is going to be the best marketing out there. Again, 
if you're not if you're explaining it in very technical terms that the patient doesn't understand, you will never ever even get to step number four of being able to present the actual financials to the patient. And this is the last thing I'll say, but in dentistry, our job is to know very well what the patient feels or thinks without them even being able to say it because they're not going to say, mom, I think you're wrong. Mom, I, you know, I don't know about that CAD cam thing, but I don't know about fill in the blank. What they are going to, they take you for granted as the expert without having to mention anything technical whatsoever. You could have the, you could have the sweetest Cyric machine in there that'll give them a crown in an hour if you want. We know it's like two, three hours, but let's say it's an hour <laughs> and you go in there and you poke them really hard with a needle, that's done. Even if they close the entire comprehensive case, you give them one hard poke on a needle, you got a real heavy hand, you're in there, they're really uncomfortable, forget about it. It's all there's all this beautiful mixture of things. And if the doc just thinks, but it's just about me or they're just only coming back from me, they're going to slowly see, you know, everything really affecting their attrition rate incredibly hardly. Yeah. Every, everything is a team. Everything's a team. And I yeah. just, um, HR is everything. They get an A and HR, they can get it low grades and everything else and be successful. So, so number three succinctly was called, okay, number one, no, you will close the case. To build reports, patient mainly. What what did you call three? Uh, explain the treatment in general terms that the patient will understand. Now, is that also? Do you also call that a clinical close? Uh, so it would be both. Yes, that would be more in the clinical close aspect of things because uh, we're not talking about financials until step four. Um, okay. So yes, that would probably be in the clinical ends of things. So now you're ready to talk about number four, which is financial close and present it in a monthly payment plan. Correct. So this is the one where sometimes the doctors are like, oh, they're, they're with me until I, I talk about this. I'm really big on third party financials. So I'm really big on having a care credit. Uh, Alfion is a really great one uh, that, that's up and coming. There's companies out there like Be Well or Green Sky. In my opinion, you should probably have two of them, at least two of them. So uh, if you have a main one and then you have a backup one, you choose whichever that is. Okay, but they're going to want to know, I mean, this, this is your expertise. This is your Correct. main thing. What's your number one, two, three, four, five? What, what's number one? Did you say Alfion? I would, uh, it would either be Care Credit or Alfion, yeah. And Alfion, um, A-L-F-E-O-N. Uh, a L P H A E O N, I believe it is. A L P H A E O N. Didn't they? Did they? A L P H E A O N. I might be butchering the name a little bit, but I'm pretty close. Was that uh, someone who acquired someone else? Uh, they, I believe, are actually part of the care credit executive team um, that has since left and is had it is now started. They were big. Elfion was big in um, derm, dermatology and plastics. And then as of, I believe it's January of this year, they started to get into dental. The, the really blunt answer to your question is that care credit is awesome because it's cross correlating. So because somebody had it at the veterinarian office or they had LASIK eye surgery done, they, a lot of times they don't realize that it cross correlates into dental. And there's even softwares out there. Like for example, Solution Reach has, um, if you use Solution Reach, your patient communication system, they'll have a little green dollar sign next to um, any of the patients that actually have care credit. And what you can do is you can hover your mouse at on the on the, on the um, practices end on their, the solution reach dashboard. You can hover over it and see approximately within the last 30 days updated how much money they have on open to buy. The only thing, though, is that sometimes the practices will say that uh, the the approval rating is 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 harder 
to get with a care credit. So really what you want to do is you want to have a backup plan like an Alfion in there or use Alfion, which is a little bit more likely to probably approve the, the uh, patients for financing. Again, you really kind of have to, that's why I say you have, you should have two of them. And to answer your question, you know, what would your top ones be? It'd be care credit and Alfion simply because then you have, you're playing with it. You're seeing which one works better in your area. Um, and you can kind of get an idea of, so let me explain number four. So number four is break it down into a monthly payment plan, monthly payment that the patients can financially and mentally afford. So the problem that a lot of the practices do is they go in there and they send somebody in there that hasn't built the rapport, really could care less, is thinking about their lunch, um, is not really about the financials, or a lot of times the doctor's trying to do that in the actual room themselves as well. And they'll go in there, like I mentioned earlier, and they'll say, okay, Howard, uh, this crown is uh, 300, this bridge is 1500, this uh, scaling and replacing is uh, 1400. Oh, you want the, the arrestin or the perio chip? Okay, that's going to be another 800, so we can put it in all, all the spots. And really, what they're doing is they're talking themselves straight out of the comprehensive treatment. The number one thing, too, that I've noticed is a lot of them s- prematurely say, okay, well, we'll start with this tooth. We'll, we'll move on to this tooth. We'll do this bridge. We'll take care of your clean. They piecemeal it because the patient, they're, they're going to, they're pre-assuming that the patient's going to say no to whatever they're, whatever they're prescribing rather than, okay, do, the, we've already done the clinical close from the doctor. Now, as the, the financial coordinator, I don't not only understand the human psychology behind why the patient say yes or no to diagnose treatment, but at the same time, I understand the clinical end of things. I'm going to recap in general terms that the patient's going to understand, ask you if you, have, if you have any questions. You don't have any questions? No, fantastic. Then I'm going to present a payment calculator to you. So all of the financial programs are going to have what's called a payment calculator where you can put in the total amount. So let's say it's $5,000. So a lot of times the practices are getting stuck probably 16 to 3,000. That's kind of where they get stuck. So to get you, let's say it's a $5,000 plan. You put in your $5,000 uh, price tag of the comprehensive treatment. And I'm talking about everything. You 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 do your your scalings. You do your arrestins or your parachip, whatever it is that you're putting in there. You put in your Oral-B or your Sonicare toothbrush. You do all everything that you need there. And even if you have something that is, oh, it could be a five surface or it could be a crown, overshoot and do the crown. And not because you're trying to take the money, but it's a lot easier to say, oh, hey, Howard, we didn't actually have to do that. We're going to actually save you money. You don't have to spend it anymore rather than have to have the financial conversation of, oh, man, I was, was trying to play it safe, but now you owe another 500 bucks. I'm really sorry. How would you like to pay for that? So- you go in there with a the financial plan. You go in there with your treatment plan, and I'm sorry, with your payment calculator. You put in the, so for instance, example, um, Care Credit or Alfion. I put in the five thousand. I hit enter, and it'll give me a list of everything what it would cost if you break it down. So, for example, you you say, okay, Howard, this is your total amount, and you point to the five thousand, but you don't actually say it. This is your total amount. You circle it with your finger so that they can see that. You pull your finger down, and it's actually designed purposely because they'll follow your finger and stop talking about the 5,000. So you never say, so here, Howard, this is your total amount. This is what that's going to be. Your options are I could do this interest-free for $287 for 18 months, or I can spread that out over a longer period of time with fill in the blank of interest to say 14.9% interest over a 60-month period, making it $86 a month put it into their hands so they can actually hold that and say, which option works best for you, Howard? And number five, stop talking. Okay. So I'm going to go back to some specifics. So where do they get this page, this financial calculator? They will get it on any of the sites. So for example, on care credit, look up, it should be on one of the main tabs. It'll say payment calculator from there. It'll pull up a different screen um, and then all they simply have to do is put in the total amount, let's say it's 5,000, whatever the case might be, hit enter, and it'll give them all the different options from the patient to be able to choose from. Okay. So on, uh, Alfion, um, they calling that, mm-hmm. um, they're calling that estimate my payment and they sure. give you the choice, no interest if paid in full within six to 12 months, 
Um, equal pay at 14.99 APR if paid in full within 24, 36, 48, or 60 months. Um, cars, 10% um, of cars and homes are sold in cash. And that's the, the practice that the dentist actually wants to have. So insane. 90% right, right. of all houses and cars are sold with financing. GMAC financing historically from birth to present has made $3 of net income for every dollar of net income that GM, the car company has made. So there's three more dollars in financing it than in making the car. Insurance, banking and financing owns all the skyscrapers pretty much around the world. And the dentist says, well, I want a cash practice. You know, it's like, okay. So, so, uh, so what do you, um, so you're relying on this team to get to know Sean, um, the best to decide if he wants no interest to pay him pull in six to 12 months or, uh, 14.99, 24, 36, 48, 60 months, or do you just present the 60 months knowing that that's how nine out of 10 people buy their car? So what you do, so a human is going to, so if you notice, number one, I didn't ask you, do you want to proceed with treatment? I didn't ask you a yes or no question. I asked you which option works best for you. So if I can, if I can put it in a verbiage in a way that I'm not asking you yes or no hard questions. So if you say no, it makes it a lot harder for me to get out of that rather than, okay, I'm going to put this payment calculator in your hand and you tell me which option works best for you. Traditionally, if you ask a human three different things, they're going to pick that middle option. When it comes down to financing, again, they know that they need that treatment. Whatever's good for the patient, it's good for the production. Why feel bad about the collection? It really just kind of then depends on the patient. So there's going to be some patients out there that say, well, hey, you know, what if I pay this all up front in cash? Can you give me a better discount? Fantastic. That's when I'll talk about my 5% discount if you pay everything up in front in full. But they're asking me that question. I'm not just suggesting that to them. Or it, you're going to have somebody that m has three kids in college and can't afford a lot right now. So they're more likely to lean towards that cheaper payment if you spread it out over a period of time. It's actually cheaper for the doctor if they do spread it out over a period of time. Or you're going to have the guy or gal that's really good with their credit, that takes very good care of their money, maybe even has the money in savings, but doesn't want to do that, or maybe has a, a huge um, uh, open to buy available about on their, on their credit card, but they don't want us to put that much money on a credit card. So I'll take the no interest option. Cause I know that I can pay that off within the, about the 18 month period of time. So really the answer to your question is in my opinion, and which has worked, that's how I've sold millions of dollars worth of treatment is I'm grouping it together in a comprehensive plan. I'm then putting it in a very easy to understand approach and I'm putting the ball in your court and letting you make the decision rather than me making the decision. When we speak, the way that I really kind of get this point across, because you're right, a lot of the doctors will say, well, I'm not going to pay 13.5. I'm not going to pay 14. I'm not going to pay 15% of my profit just simply so that patients can pay for it. Hey, you know what, doc? You don't have to do anything. You do. I'm putting the ball back in your court. You don't have to do anything that you don't want to do. But what I am telling you is that 80% of 100 is way better than 0% of 100. You make the choice. The, the real thing, a lot of times the way that they kind of comprehend it is when you go to Comcast, when you go to AT&T, what is the question that you ask them? How much is this going to be on a monthly basis? You don't say, how much is this going to be for 10 years? How much is, am I going to pay you over the five-year period of time? You ask them, how much is this going to be a month? Because humans understand a monthly budget and you could have a caviar budget, but, or you could have a ramen noodles budget. Either way you have a budget. So by giving them that option of which option works best for you, you're allowing them to be very comfortable about the choice that they're choosing and letting it work with, with whether it's, it's 5% cash back. If that's what they are, um, 5% off with cash up front if that's what they ask for or an interest free or a monthly payment plan. And even if you run, I'm sorry, extended payment plan, even if you run it and can't get approved 
they're a heck of a lot less uh, more likely to let you then chunk everything out. Okay, well, now we can't get you approved for any of this. I apologize. Will you let me know where you'd like to move from there? Then they start with, okay, well, I could probably do, I've got $1,000 in my savings. I could probably do that right now. Okay, well, let's start with this scaling and root planning because this is the foundation that your teeth sit in, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Really, the, the, you want them feeling like, it's kind of a weird way to put it, but you want them wanting more. Either like, I'm really excited about, I can start this treatment or, or uh, okay, I'll start with here and then I'll work my way up to what it is. The, the trick really though is, is to be really comfortable, like step number one is know that you're going to close the case and know whatever's good for the production. I'm sorry for the patient. It's good for the production. Why feel bad about the collection? Just present it to them because as oral health care providers, we're in the industry of preventative care. Yes, we will absolutely restore, but we're really not truly doing our, I'm not a dentist, but as a practice, we're not truly doing our duty uh, I don't know if you could say fiduciary duty of making sure that these patients live healthier lives by delaying any of the treatment. And a lot of times, simply just because we're not comfortable with the financials as the practice, it's delaying treatment and actually making it worse. So, okay, well, we'll start with this tooth, but what about this tooth down here that I could have just saved it with a, with a filling and now I've waited six months or another year because then I'll get more money with my deductible. I'm allowing the insurance companies to dictate how I'm going to practice. And then all of a sudden now that $200 feeling is turned into, you know, a $600 crown. It really doesn't have to be that way. And at a minimum, if I'm presenting it into the comprehensive uh, treatment plan and presenting it that way, and you tell me, no, I've done my job. I, I, I've told you what's going to happen. What's going to happen if you don't do that? I've done my best to make it financially affordable for you. I've gone through all of the human nature that I know that it takes to buy this treatment. And then therefore, you tell me yes or no. And and really, the thing is that, you know, um, you just want to plant as many seeds as possible because a, a no today doesn't necessarily, especially in cosmetic, a no to, well, no, 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 I can't do that today. It could very well mean I'll, I'll see you in two years when I get a divorce and I'm really looking for a significant other again, I'm on the market. I want to look the best I possibly can in two years because you planted that seed on all yours. Okay, but I, I know my homies. I know them. The first stumble, uh, they're sure. going to say, uh, the, the, they're gonna, the patient is going to say, uh, well, what is the insurance going to pay? I mean, should, should we just do what the insurance is going to pay? That That's the first thing they're going to say. In Phoenix. True. So, 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 so when they say, well... What is the insurance paying? Shouldn't we just do what the insurance is going to pay? So really, if that is something that you're experiencing a lot in your practice, you want to hit that head on before you even asked about that. So again, verbiage. So if you're presenting the financials, you could start with the great news is, Howard, uh, the insurance is going to take care of $1,000 of this. But then this is your out-of-pocket cost right here. And again, if you've done a really good clinical close, the patients, it's not going to be as much about money as far as how do I save more money and not get it worse. So to answer your question is, I would hit it head on and rather than leaving them to say, them to ask you about the insurance, you hit it right on and you say, well, the fantastic news is, Howard, your insurance is gonna take care of 500 bucks. The fantastic news is your insurance is gonna uh, pay $1,000, 1,500 if it's union, 2,500 or you know whatever the case might be in that situation. Yeah, when they ask, uh, well, how long will it last? And I say, well, you know, a dentist or a physician can only slow down your rate of descent to guaranteed death. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> You're yeah. going to absolutely die with or without this root canal, but I can help you slow down your rate of guaranteed death. Um, so, um, so when you go into a dental office, um, when uh, I know you've consulted with the big dogs, um, do you usually find one team member is one position is more of a problem than the other? I mean, is it the dentist, the hygienist, the assistant, the front? When you see people, that that in the last that last year 2018 they didn't do a sure. single ten thousand dollar case, let alone a new car thirty thousand. They 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 haven't done one big tree plan a year. Where is this usually coming from? 
what bluntly put a lot of times it comes from the communication of the actual staff. So you walk in there and you realize that the hygienist doesn't understand how important the dental assistant is. And they just think that they're just an assistant or the front desk isn't realizing that they're the nucleus of the communication that goes on in the, in the practice. So it a lot of times it has to do with communication itself and it's sitting down a lot of times the easiest way to kind of pop that pimple, if you will, in the practice is put them all in one room and then just listen to what they have to say uh, and ask them individually, well, you know, what is your really important role as a hygienist? How do you affect things? What could you do to do to make things better? How, and again, if we're talking about treatment case, so okay, we haven't done a $10,000 plan. How come you don't think we've done a $10,000 plan? And go through individually with, with each team member and ask them in front of everybody. Not you can do it individually and tell them what you expect as a consultant or, you know, as a doctor. A lot of times if it's doctor and consultant at the same time, because they're the leaders. That's another thing, too. A lot of times it has to do with the doctor let the staff kind of run the show, although they should run the show. The doctor is the leader. He's the he or she is the one that it. it yes, it's a top down mentality, but they're a true leader is the one that's going to be able to to when it happens, do that person's job no matter whatever the situation might be. So, for instance, if the if the dental assistant is struggling with a bunch of garbage and she's trying to take it out to the thing, you know, the, the doctor that says, ah, this is, this is above me. I don't need to do that is a much different doctor, especially on the communication end of things. When you work it back to that $10,000 case, let me help you with that garbage. Let me help you do your job that I know that I, I'd be willing to stick my head out and do your job as well. Again, I'm getting off topic, but it's uh, usually about communication and they don't all know why everything is so incredibly important with, with each other and why it relates to the bigger picture. And really the reason that they're probably not doing the $10,000 case is there's a breakdown along the line somewhere. So again, the dental assistant uh, example of doctor does an incredible clinical close. The financial coordinator has gone in there, make it financially and mentally affordable for the patient. They then turn to the patient, to the to the dental assistant and say, do I really need this? And she, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. It's just, I, I just work here. It's a much different discussion than reinforcing the need and having the dental assistant realize how important of a role that they play. And that one tiny little weak link could kill everything else for the rest of that entire treatment plan, especially if it's cosmetics. If you come from another science and, uh, you know, they always talk about a presentation requires an open, a body and a close. Uh, the stop sure. talking, that's a close. You also break this up three ways into an open body or close. Can you define any of those five steps as uh, open body or close? Or do you think that's totally different? You can absolutely do that. The reason that I do the five steps is because a lot of times, you know, stories sell, features tell kind of thing. That sort of tells a story and it's a lot easier for them to be able to understand, especially if I'm talking to a dental assistant that's making $12 an hour that really only cares about making sure that she can take care of her kids, feed her family, et cetera. That five steps really kind of does that for me. I guess that that's the way that I would answer that question. Have you seen any, um, besides your, your consulting and, uh, which has been very successful and, um, you're talked about on dental town, um, um, with, uh, say Del Carnegie uh, classes, Toastmasters, stand up comedy, improv. Have you seen any of those structural disciplines help dentists in your career become better? Uh, Sure. Yeah. I mean, anything that can like even like an improv class, if they can go out and take an improv class and they can be comfortable because you're in, in a dental office, you're always on stage. So the, the, the best, you know, everybody plays a role and everybody when you're when you're 
in front of that coming out of that break room, you're on stage and everybody has to realize that. So even if you took, for example, a, an improv class that would probably, if you took you and your entire team to an improv class, that would probably even be even better because it'd be a team building experience. You really kind of get to stress that, Hey, when we're on when we're live, when we're out there, when we're in our operatories, when we're in the front desk, when we're walking through, we're on stage, man. And we got to be the best possible play out there because if not, they're going to go down to the play down, you know, down the street. There's the problem with dentistry is there's so much competition. There's like you could walk out. The, I could a lot of these practices. I could walk out. I could throw a stone and hit four more practices on the same block. So to answer your question, absolutely. If you can improv, would be awesome. If you can go to an improv class with your team, it's a team building experience. And if you really want to even go full blown. Bring their spouses with them too, because if their spouses can buy in on that kind of stuff, you're gonna see. You you know you when you walk into it, even as a patient, you know if they're true. Uh, I guess this is the only way I can say it, true thespians, you know, or are they just pretending, or you know the the two assistants that hate each other. You know uh, the front desk manager that could really could care less. You know, if the doctor's just there for the money, it's a team atmosphere. So I think something like, uh, like improv, that'd be awesome for the staff. What I, what I think is um, bizarre is that, you know, in capitalism, the 20 richest countries, what they do best is banking, insurance, financing. They get capital to the people, whether it's a home mortgage, a student loan, whatever. And the 200 poor countries, you have little access to other people's money. And if they've learned anything in 500 years of banking, is that finding people to loan money to, that's the easy part. Getting them to pay it back is the hard part. And these dentists don't even uh, believe they can do the easiest part, which is getting uh, the patient to borrow a bunch of money for five years so he can leave with a million dollar smile. I had four boys, and to this day, anytime one of their friends ever gets a new car, or now it's a truck, they always got to come by the house and show it to me. And they're so excited, oh, and, and they're just, everybody's thrilled. And it's like, and, and they're going to go through that experience 13 times. Well, imagine the feel. I mean, I remember one time I completed a, uh, a full mouth case on a lady who fully knew that one day she was going to be no teeth. And she was down to the front 10 teeth, upper and lower. They're all broken down. It was a uh, total rehab. When it was done and she saw, she had to take a knee. She just, she couldn't breathe. And, yeah. and, and, and it's like, and, and these dentists, uh, they won't even go there. I mean, I mean, women lose all their teeth and take their own life. I mean, I've had a couple of patients in my career tell me that they wish they would have done implants and 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 um, go to fix years ago because when they got their denture um they no longer could kiss their husband or be intimate with their husband and then they went to two separate rooms and then a couple of years later he moved out and then and she looks back and she said the whole thing was because i i didn't take care of my mouth and th and then i'm talking to a dentist who's like well i, I don't like selling dentistry really you wouldn't want to solve that problem I mean, are you a monster? Yeah, yeah. Who wouldn't want to? I mean, and as far as paying them back, when you use a third-party financial group, that's their problem. It's it's like when one of my boys wrecks a car. I I just want to know if everybody's okay. Um, right, State right. Farm is the one who should really be worried about, uh, you know, what the heck happened. Uh, but um, I'm going to go back to the third-party financials and dentistry. You said Alfie was number one, sure. Care Credit number two. Yep. Did you say Lending Club is your third choice? Uh, there's Lending USA, uh, there's Green Sky, there's Be Well. Um, I I would probably stick with the the my two go tos are probably Alfion and Care Credit, Care Credit and, and Alfion, depending on what you want. I just want to at least because I know that a lot of the students listen to you and they're going to have to go, you know, figure out what they need to do into their practice as far as the business end of things. I at least just want to let them know what's out there. It, they all have uh, different programs of kind of like what they offer and what they don't offer. So traditionally, what I I, I Alfion and Care Credit could be perfect for me. Be Well could be perfect for you. So traditionally, what I do is I list all of them, and then 
I tell you to go out there and see which one works best for you. Again, it, it depends on what you want to offer. Uh, it depends on how long you want to offer it. Um, did you want a revolving account, meaning like you can spend, so as you pay down care credit or Alfion, it's like a credit card. You can then put more money on that card. Those are the ones that either one of the reasons that I like those programs simply because yes, I'm even at the higher end, if I'm offering 18 months, I'm probably paying 14.9, probably 12, depending on which company you have, probably 12. I'd say really low end if you get lucky, 11.9 to 14.9 for like an 18 month no interest. But if it's a revolving account, yes, I'm taking that 15% out of my chunk, but that you kind of, uh, for lack of better words, train your patients to say, oh, can I use my care credit card for that? Oh, my son has whitening. He's got prom coming up. Oh, uh, my my uh, my husband, we're getting married. He's always wanted to, to fix number eight or number nine because it's right there in the front. My daughter's bugging him. Can we use that care credit card for there? So really what the age old problem with with financing in an office is that the doctor says, well, I'm not going to pay $15 out of that hundred dollars. That's only 85 that I get out of there. The lab costs are going to, and then they start kind of talking themselves out of it. But the problem is that they end up saving this money, but they end up talking, they, the patients won't do any of the treatment because it's not financially affordable. And then it's also not mentally affordable. The problem too, is that not everybody can come up with Let's say it's a $1,500 bridge. Not everybody can just, boom, come up with the $1,500, but they can for sure come up with setting their name on a care credit or an Alfion account and then not having to pay for, let's say, 15 to 30 days out. And then it just, again, it makes it financially and mentally affordable uh, for them to be able to say yes to the treatment. That's the thing is you just want them to say yes. If nobody's saying if everybody's saying no to your treatment, even if they totally believe in what you have to do, what you have to say, and it's just because of the cost, your your biz, your doors aren't going to be open for very long. You just want to make it financially and mentally affordable for the clients, patients, and then they're more likely to do more treatment down the line for you and more likely to say, hey, you know, you got to go to Dr. Lee because he's fantastic. He, his staff is wonderful. They treat me like family. They make it very affordable for me. You, you, you got to go to this guy. He's absolutely fantastic. Or a new coworker moves into town. Hey, do you know a good dentist? Boom. Absolutely. I know a good, a good dentist. You got to go see Dr. Lee fill in the blank. Um, you know why I like care credit so much where I just think it's uh, in, invaluable is, um, you know, when you're a, um, when you're a dentist and you went to college for nine years, you know that when you have a test um, that, um, you know, it matters what everybody else got. They always, you know, I remember one time I took a physics test and I missed 12 out of 40 and I was almost ready to puke. And then I found out after the curve that the best person in the class missed 10. So, so yeah. when, when they care credit, can show you what everybody's, the volume everybody's going through in your zip code, in your county. And what blows their mind is when they sit there and say, dude, the vet across the street, the six $5,000 cases a month on dogs and cats. And you can't, and you didn't do it one time on a homo sapien who's driving a $33,000 new car, but, but a dog, Fido, Fido got $5,000 and so, so when they, and then the ruffles come up when they start finding out that the guy they're competing with at the other end of first street in Maine is, is going through 10 times the volume. And, and, and then what, and then when they're telling you that their patients don't have any money and you just say, well, let's just walk outside and watch the cars go by. And it's just one forty, fifty thousand dollar car truck after another, just swinging by, even though you're in the middle of Wichita, Kansas. So it's uh, I am. Um, so that be well financing um, uh, is FTL finance. So that's what that is. Be well at FTL. Okay, mm -hmm. I, I didn't. Uh, um, I did not know that. I learned stuff from my own show. Um, so I want to go to just a quick uh, thing. Um, I've seen uh, you post on Dental Town, and I, I appreciate it so much. Um, but one one uh, help with six month out appointment no shows. What what do you tell people yeah. with that? 
So it depends. Like in that instance, she was, I believe, trying to just say, hey, should I stop pre-booking, um, you know, a lot of my, my patients? Is your question like, should they do the six months out or should they not? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. How, how would you handle the recall with six month appointment? Do you, do you pre book six months out? Do you remind them the night before, or you any strong? Uh, um... Sure. Yeah. So, in my opinion, unless there are a like really, when you were we we'll look at your pre booking ratio, probably a healthy ratio is about eighty five percent because you don't necessarily want to book everybody. So, for example, just to fill a spot or just to help your pre booking ratio. The guy that always cancels last minute or the guy that the gal that no shows constantly, she, you want her in that 15 percent. You don't want her in that 85 percent. You want to really solidly be booking everybody you possibly can that you know is going to be good for it. So in my to answer your question, I would have them pre book a lot of times have it done in the clinical room, clinical setting, because they're less likely to say no, especially to a provider like a dentist, if you're coming in for your check, oh, Susie, the hygienist, have we gone ahead and, and pre-booked that appointment? They're much more likely to say yes to book it right there rather than going up to the front and saying, well, let me check my calendar and I'll get back to you. If they don't, if you're not pre-booking in the room, which you definitely should be, if you're not, then if they do get to the front, the front desk has to be prepared for Okay, well, hey, you know what? Nobody really knows what they're doing six months out. Let's go ahead and book you right now. And then really the trick is to have enough reminders for you to be able to fill in any holes that do happen. So let's say you send out – the trick, too, is to find out what the patient likes. Do they like a phone call? Do they like an email? Do they like a text? And be able to offer any of the things that they that they're off that that they prefer. That's the number one rule: is communicate with them and how they like to do it, and not make it easier on you, but make it easier on the patient to be able to uh, come to you guys and be part of your family. So I would say probably a month out if you're if you're sending out if you're not sending out recall cards or whatever you do it, send out a reminder one month out. Remind them that this is a verified, this is a reserved appointment time. If they can't make their appointment uh, to, to give you a 20, I'm sorry, 48 hour notice. So at least you're not having the front desk at five, at 445, trying to book your 8 a.m. appointment for the next morning. And at the same time, have a really strong short call list for you to be able to plug in people that are looking for those appointments. So a lot of times, let's say like that that lady uh, was booking out six months and she's like, hey, these are really valuable times. You really wanna make sure that you have people on the list that can come in, but not just one person. Let's say it's 10 people. Again, kind of going back to the fear of loss, fear of losing them, of losing the appointment. First person to call basically gets the appointment. So the patient's are calling you like, oh, can I please take that appointment? Can I please take that appointment before somebody else does? And then let's say you have three other calls. These are fantastic too, because you can say, well, unfortunately I've already booked that one appointment, but I have next Tuesday and then two Tuesdays out from now, I have those eight o'clock appointments. Would you want those times? Really the trick is to give the patients the communication, in, in my opinion, absolutely pre-book, but book the 85% of people that are really strong rather than the 15% of people that kind of no-show you on you all the time and make sure that you're reminding them soon enough to give them the opportunity to cancel so that you can fill that appointment when it does come up. Okay, man, you, uh, Patrick, really, I mean, I called you, you did not call me. Um, I, um, I'm a big, huge fan of yours, but I just want to tell all my Thank homies, you. I mean, I, I'm a dentist. I, I get it. I, I've done dentistry for 32 years. Uh, almost every single person listening to this show uh, doesn't even have a 32-year-old child. And if you do, uh, email me, Howard at Dentaltown.com, or leave a comment in the YouTube section uh, that you really have a child older than how many years I've done dentistry. And I'm telling you that, you know, you got to get your house in order. You got to get poised for growth. And yep. until you get the right people on your team and you get yep. all the right business, um, um, every all your systems in place, you're not going to take off. And I know you guys, 
And you always think that, oh, if I just went and mastered TMJ or learned how to do ortho or learned how to place implants or bone grafting or take that Invisalign course, you always think that your fledging restaurant is going to come to life when you get that new recipe of some new linguine pasta, chicken, parmigiana. That ain't the problem. There's restaurants crushing it in every food genre, in every city in America, because they have their house in order. And the only thing you can do to invest in yourself to get all that money back plus more in one calendar year is a consultant. It's not a piece of equipment. It's not a CAD cam, it's not a CVC, it's none of that. I mean, just, I mean, and in fact, you say you wanna learn how to place uh, implants. My God, I could come to your town and go get a periodontist in the next town over a hundred miles away to come over on Fridays and place all your implants for a 50-50 fee and, and guarantee that the implant's gonna be higher quality and you're gonna make more net income because you won't even know how to factor in the cost of going all around the world and all these courses and buying implants and bone grafting and all that stuff like that. The business of dentistry and the clinical delivery of dentistry are two separate things. And yeah. I love clinical dentistry. I love doing dentistry, um, but I, I, I love um, pulling wisdom teeth the most but it has nothing to do with business. And guys like Rick Workman that own a thousand dental offices, he could have owned a thousand pizza huts. He just happened to go into dentistry. Um, but um, thank you so much for coming on the show. He's Sean Patrick Field. His website is PCG Dental Consulting. That's PCG Dental Consulting. So the PC, the G is Patrick Consulting Group dental consulting at gmail thanks so much for coming on the show buddy